I've seen so many skunks lately. As somebody who's foreign, are there skunks in the UK, Mike? No. We don't have no. them in Australia. Well, either. the Tories, but. Okay. <laughs> nice. Hey. <laughs> Welcome, We're audience. Back, it's been baby. too long. <laughs> um, no, I've seen like four skunks, and they're very mm. cute, but every time, I just don't know what yeah, you're keep, really supposed to do about them. Keep it. Dis- keep your distance. Yeah, I had a when I lived in um, the Bay Area. Uh, mm. The dog that I lived with, little Pomeranian boy, got skunked and stank for like two full weeks. Wow! It was it's disgusting. No it's so strong. Like you can smell if a skunk has gone off probably a day beforehand. If you're just in the area, it's oh, it's wild. Jesus, is it that bad? Oh yeah. I've only ever seen it in like cartoons and stuff. No, it's terrible. They're very cute, and I think they just yeah. like rummage around and eat trash like raccoons do, but. They like that hmm. smell is no joke. I associate them growing up in Colorado. Every now and again, one would end up as roadkill uh, on like a highway, and you would essentially pass through the cloud within like a day of its death, and 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 you'd pick up the smell within they, your oh, car. Oh, even when they're dead, it smells. I guess. Like I'm assuming that like whatever killed it. You know, it wasn't like sudden death. I'm assuming that it it sort of traumatically did its little blast. Right. Or they have a gland that when dead. Could be. All I know is. Like that. It's it's like it's like in Dune. Yeah. (laughs) All all I know is that I have many memories as a kid where it literally it it's like passing through a a, a literal cloud where you just I just blew my mind that in a car you'd be like. Holy shit! What is that? Uh, and it's they're, yeah, no, they're it's like, never it's experienced like, this. It's like grassy but acidic at the same time. It's a very distinct smell. It's almost like if you took weed and made it just the nastiest thing you've ever smelled. Like okay, because it is it is grassy smelling in a weird way. It's fucking. I've always terrible. thought it smelled extremely similar to weed. It does. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but worse, much much worse. Presumably, yeah. that's why it's called skunk. Uh, oh my fucking god <laughs> Holy shit. Uh, yeah I've seen them when walking uh, canvas if we are walking around at like daybreak you know occasionally we'll take her out at like six in the morning when it's when it's basically right at sunrise and more than once I've come across them and she's always like hey what's that and it's kind of like it's a standoff you know look but don't touch yeah exactly because uh, yeah they, they, they do act super adorable but I've seen a I've seen it like raise its tail kind of like a scorpion where it's sort of like, this is the sign I'm giving you, I'm giving you all the you advance warning. notice. Don't want that yeah. heat. Don't want that heat. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of standoffs, I have this Come conversation on. with some friends recently. Um, I've never particularly liked the traditional spaghetti Western. And I think maybe I have not given one enough of a chance that I need to sit through it, but they're so long. And then anytime that I see clips of them, <laughs> my issue is that it's just a lot of old men staring at each other while music plays. Just so much of men I'm just... F- I'm, I'm trying to find the problem. Uh, I'm trying. I'm looking for your uh, I, critique. I was like, is it just... This is like massive masculine fantasy where you just want to hold a gun and stare at another man? And that's why I'm like, I don't... Why would I want to watch this five-minute stare fest? <laughs> First <laughs> off, if we're talking about Leone, it's not just music. It is some of the greatest music in the history of cinema. I don't disagree. The that would be a is- subset of music, though, in fairness. Still music, actually, Austin. Yeah. Still music, Austin. But I'm saying it is not merely music. <laughs> this, Ennio Morricone invented a genre. And, you know, he wrote that he before they shot. I did know that. He wrote the music and then played it to them. They would First. play it back on set. Mm. That's cool. Yeah. Also, like, those movies must have been so hard to make because people were speaking in different languages. Also, every, all of the dialogue was recorded in post. And so on the sets, they were just working. So people were building sets while they were filming. So it was the loudest set in the world because they knew that they weren't going to capture that any of the audio. It. Yeah. So they were like just building stuff in the background. It was while a the proper production acting. line, wasn't it? Back yeah. Then. Proper production line. Yeah. To have men staring at each other. You describing it as just men staring at each other reminds me that Kerry does. describes my my the genre of movies I enjoy that she doesn't as men in room talking. Men in Rooms Talking. I love Men in Rooms Talking. Yeah. I love Men in Rooms Talking movies, but Carrie's not a big fan. My favorite movies are always just like 
like things I love is is literally just people in a room talking. If they don't ever leave mm-hmm. the room, even better. Oh. <laughs> they stay in the same room the whole time. Incredible. Four inch chest or like incredible, rope, like a, a proper one room. Even Reservoir is Dogs is pretty close. Like all of the the action in yep. that is just one room. Saw oh, yeah. counts. I think Saw is unironically a very good film, despite it being horror and, and obviously like just appealing it's to the gore. Movie. The first the first Saw is a good film. I like the talking. Episode. Just the best. Yeah, my favorite just episode of Breaking Bad is the fly episode. Mm. Oh my god, Better Call Saul's back. Yeah, I've never watched Hype. it. Oh, is you know how you like, like Breaking Bad? You're gonna. Oh. You're gonna. Yeah, they're gonna take Saul and over five years they're gonna make you as invested in him as you were in Heisenberg. I've only just in the last like month realized that I've been a little bit asleep on that one. Cause I watched, I think the first season and into the second one. And I was just for some reason having a hard time of staying Soul committed. Breaking yeah. Bad. No, Back no. Breaking Soul, bad. Yeah. I was like, I was definitely one of those cultists yeah. that was like, you know, having a conversation with a, me is predicated on you being a fan burn. of the show at this point. <laughs> It, it's got less rocket fuel at the start than Breaking Bad did. Cause there's a certain point, especially for the first season of Bear Call Saul, you're like, why am I watching? It's a bit. It's a bit like you know any prequel. Like it's just like why am I? I know where all these characters are going to end up. I know it just it doesn't. And 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 the Cranston, characters. Wouldn't he wouldn't be right. Um, he's. I think he's announced for the new series. I think that was a press release they put out. But, but yeah, the um. No, but it but would be first, basically like, out of necessity. It would have to be essentially a cameo, just given. Yeah. Uh, g- given like what you know and of most their relationship. Of the Breaking Bad, yeah, most of the Breaking Bad cast has shown up in it at some point, but you see them at like earlier points in their lives. It's right. it's so good. And but yes, for the first season or two, I definitely was watching it going, I'm watching this because I liked Breaking Bad, but I don't know what I don't know why this story exists. Yeah. And obviously <laughs> just like Breaking Bad. That's me watching Castle after Firefly was cancelled. Uh I was like <laughs> This is not really satisfying my need for more Firefly, but I apparently have to watch this. Uh, uh, and um, this my favorite was when they. Nathan Fillion, you're going to I, my favorite was there was an episode of that show where they overtly made fun of the demographic of me and presumably lots of other. Where it's a Halloween episode where it starts he off with him up, right? in his Malcolm Reynolds costume, and his daughter says, "What is this outfit supposed to be?" And he goes, "I'm a space cowboy." She goes, "Didn't you wear this for Halloween like five years ago?" And he goes, "Yeah, but it's a classic." And she goes, "I think it's time to let it go." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "I feel very attacked right now." Uh, <laughs> Why they have to call you out like that? Yeah, it was. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, um, watch Bear Call Saul for um for as much for the other characters than Saul, to be honest. Like it's, TV it's show a list is lot of long. Michael. I mean, it's look, a lot Vince, of, it's a lot Vince of Gilligan great. earned my eternal loyalty with Breaking Bad is basically the only show ever that sustained a quality and actually managed to deliver on an ending befitting the buildup. I mean, it's one of the only, yeah. it's like, it's, you know, it's one of those that it's, it is sort of a caricature to hype that show at this point. You are, you are silly, but it is perfect. I mean, it is, it is yeah. one of those things where it became, uh, this ritual with my group of friends to watch the new episodes each week where, you know, it was like there were like 10 of us that would just gather and sit on the edge of our couch like, what the fuck? Uh, and just absolutely became this staple of our life. I'm just and really excited that you've still got five more seasons of that to watch. It's gonna You're going to have a great time with it. You're going to have a great time. Right. The last time I remember that being a phenomenon was Lost. Where because mm, it one was I also airing on, on TV with, and yeah. everybody was talking about it at the same time, like yeah, that at uni I remember of, we used to gather in someone's dorm room and just watch like each other until season two, about three episodes in, where a lot of us started. To everyone peel fell off. off. But, it's just a little bit yeah. difficult now because of streaming. Like nobody's when you know you're mm. not watching the same TV shows inherently. Like there are just so many options. Well, also, yeah. I also I was having a conversation with a friend about this exact phenomenon, uh, which I think could potentially also relate to games insofar as the Game Pass style mm. business models of if retention, is, if subscription retention is the goal and th- you you merely need to make sure people hang on to that and there's no kind of, it's less about having a hit that, makes a gazillion dollars but it lowers the bar therefore to 
I just need games good enough to keep them from unsubscribing. You end up with a glut of potentially fairly, uh, you know, potentially even reasonably great, but, but rarely like truly, truly ambitious and crazy because they just don't have to. Now I could see the other argument being the case that it actually buys them the freedom to be more risky. But the friend of mine pointed out since Netflix and, and the others that followed Disney plus Hulu, blah, 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 uh, sort of ascended to the, the throne. What, has there been anything even remotely approaching a kind of cultural event uh, of a show? And and his argument was there's only been one and it's not to the degree. And it's also like campy, but in a way that knows it is. And so it's really not the same, which is Stranger Things. That's probably the biggest, like true, like hmm. in terms of cultural reach, Do you something think that's that about everyone quality? is talking about. Game of Thrones. Do you think that's about qu- Game of Thrones? But Game of Thrones predates streaming... Like but I, do I you mean, think like that's the quality yeah, model. I don't think that's. I don't think that's because those shows. I don't. That, I don't think that's because shows now are worse than they were. It's just about choice, like Alana said, right? Like, there's a lot of TV now that's better than Lost, right? But it's, it's true. Is I less think the overall like because you've got so much is stuff. higher. Yeah. Yeah. But no. But look, to, by your definition, there, you're saying that the reason, or sorry, my extrapolation of what you're saying there is that the reason Lost was a phenomenon was because it was excellent. Well, it seems like which is I don't know of, if that's true. I think it was just the one of four things you could watch, and therefore picked up an audience. And, and I think it great. was excellent at the time for something airing on primetime TV. It was unlike mm. anything a lot of people had ever seen, considering how how available it was. Whereas, sure, uh, that show is I, also I think now there's uh, more my, competition of very good things. Yeah. You, you're not um, limited to a small pool of things, right. so therefore you're not. And I would argue, to be honest, that. I would say maybe some of the Marvel TV shows have achieved that, right? Like, I think... I remember WandaVision, WandaVision? being a thing that everyone was talking about. I Loki as for well, a I month. think, to an extent. Like, well, yeah, we, that's you're right. Stranger Things, shows on. No, but Stranger Things is culturally relevant slash renowned in a way that WandaVision is not. We're not still talking about WandaVision. Stranger that's, Things, even though, sure, fun. there's a new season and I'm not watching anymore because I think it got bad... Stranger Things is a thing that you... But it's also interesting because Stranger Things still only exists because of fucking it. <laughs> like, even that comes from a previous cultural thing that we knew beforehand, which is 80s kids on bikes. So it, it just extended the I mean, to an previous... extent, name one... Name any any work of art that's not inspired by a work of art 80s kids on bikes. You know? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all the good Beethoven art is inspired was, by was 80s kids on bikes. Beethoven was kids on bikes. Inspired by 80s all kids All of them. Bikes. A lot of them. It's an interesting, yeah, I, um, I, I think it's, there are, there are sort of two parallel lanes there of, of there are one to rule them all is less prevalent in a world where there's just so much more content and that overall the average quality is higher, probably significantly higher. I mean, the average show on Netflix is better than the average show on ABC 15 years ago. Um, I think it's probably safe Netflix, to assume. Though. I just watched this yeah, movie the other night. I'm not sure I believe night. that either, Hang to on, be honest. Current... Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would I say HBO. The point is I'm, saying, I'm, brilliant. I'm saying average. Like, there's yeah, always going to yeah. be a mix of, of great and mediocre and, and generic and whatever. But, like, if I pick something at random, um, it, it you know... All it, this could be another thing of, you know, the way their their, you know, uh, content curation per user works. Where, you know, network TV obviously doesn't do that. You, if I turn on NBC right now, I'll see whatever they're showing. Whereas if I pick something at random, it's not actually random. It's the things that Netflix has a hunch I will like, um, and so the odds of me liking it go up the more I watch Netflix. It's also temporarily. Is your point that on, but but temporarily, like ABC fifteen years ago, you're comparing the prime time slot. If we if we continued your randomization to any time in twenty four hours on that network, you randomly chose something. Obviously, the quality bar would slide down significantly, right? Yeah, well, I, I that is what I meant actually. I was saying, oh, okay. it, like at any given time, the quality is likely to have been lower. 
Like, yes, there is the occasional primetime prestige kind of show, but surrounded by lots of stuff that is hardly that. Um, whereas the overall aggregate appears to be higher. As a side note regarding Lost, mm. um, that show, you know, to the end of the, once we got into the, like, the early 2000s, um, basically all TV stopped recording, not all, but almost all uh, TV stopped recording their scores with live musicians because computer, you know, virtual instruments had kind of reached a point that they real, and also just turnaround times. Wow, uh, were 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 always sort of shrinking and shrinking. So whereas you have like Star Trek: Next Generation recording at Stage M, Paramount with a sixty-piece orchestra every week, and and still to this day, The Simpsons recording with a live orchestra, um, the that became increasingly an extinct species and lost. And now it's made a little bit of a comeback. Like all the Disney plus and Marvel shows, they all record, you know, with pretty grand uh, orchestras. And then like mm. the high profile um, stuff like, uh, you know, agents of shield and a lot of that, like these are all using live orchestra. And there's still, of course, the majority is probably still done uh, virtually or in a hybrid model, but lost was the one with uh, Michael Giacchino, that was kind of like his first really big credit in his career. I was going to say, that was his breakout, right? That was basically Technically, like Alias would have big... been because Alias oh, okay. was also J.J. Abrams and led directly to Lost. But um, but Alias he got because J.J. Abrams was a gamer who played Medal of Honor. No and way. heard Giacchino's music in Medal of Honor. Wow. Um, and, and, and sort of brought him over from there. He has had the, the absolute luckiest daisy chain uh, because he got... He got you know, initially started in games doing Spielberg's The Lost World and Call of Duty and Medal of Honor in the late 90s. And then J.J. Abrams played those, hired him for Alias and Lost, and then Brad Bird watched Lost and called him to do The Incredibles. Wow. And, uh, so it's just like this incredible, insane handoff of like some of the biggest name talents. But but um, hit, they recorded at Capitol Records with like, it, it was every single week was exactly the same. It was, it was like 20 three or so strings, four trombones, piano, and Emil Richards, uh, a harp and Emil Richards on percussion for every episode of Lost. It became <laughs> kind of like their palette. And it was there were no mm. electronics. It was 100% that orchestra in that room. And that kind of started the Hollywood going, you know, I guess it's not that expensive, and it mm. really does sound better. And I was, so uh, all the like, you know, TV people, uh, TV composers owe a, a longstanding debt of gratitude to Giacchino for kind of he and J.J. Abrams and Bad Robot for kind of saying, no, we actually we're willing to spend the money on this. We we think this mm. is worth it. Um, so it's had to come. So I always. Yeah. I mean, again, it not every show can afford it. Yeah. But, but even like even seemingly very straight ahead, like I've, I have a friend who scores the CW remake of uh of uh, Kung Fu the remake is it's, it's so different from the original Kung Fu that I don't even know if remake counts as anymore. It's just the, the complete reboot in the of that. Yeah. It's like show. a totally different oh, wow. thing from that. I think uh, I haven't, I haven't watched it, but a friend of mine named Sherry Chung writes the score for it. And I see her routinely recording with strings. She'll post on Instagram like, Oh, you know, season two, episode three, here's a little glimpse of what we recorded for that or whatever. And like, you know, so even a show like that, which CW is notoriously like, how can we spend the least amount possible? Um, they're still putting up some money for something. Uh, mm. And and I think that, that yeah. if it hadn't been for Lost validating that, uh, you know, maybe someone else would have come along and Thanks, done it. Lost. But it made a big difference. Appreciate you. Yeah, I always associate. Anytime you mentioned I think of Simpsons, show, Austin. I'm going to bring you back. You mentioned Simpsons, which yes, made sir. me think Danny Elfman, which I think the audience needs to know your opinion of Buff Elfman. Have you seen the picture? <laughs> yeah, him at Coachella. Yeah. What? Uh, Oh, a lot. Of, oh, you're about to go on the journey. Yeah, just type in Danny Elfman Coachella. I'd like to remind you while you type that in, he's 68 years old. Danny he's Elfman older. Coachella. Is he? I thought he was older. Is he only? Is he 68? Okay, I thought he was 70. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. no. should, I, should I be looking at news? Losing his shirt. There you go. Just do a Google Losing image. His shirt. The Google image comes up with a lot of different shit that. Uh, is okay, I'm just gonna to send you. Identify. I'm gonna send you the image. Oh wow, I that see. One's... There she is. Oh wow, <laughs> <laughs> bro, he hot. Yeah. What the hell? Yeah, he's he's always been. What the fuck? Uh, 
He's always been one of a kind. The, have you seen the comparisons? There's like a photo of him from like 20 years ago where he looks older. Have you seen that comparison? Really? So, uh, I, I haven't, but I, I don't doubt it. I mean, he always Damn, had a kind dude. of, he always had a kind of like, you know, like Igor quality. He's always kind of just been different. Um, and uh, so it makes him in a way ageless, but I think he's also really wow, he's, conscientiously he's taking care of himself. He's totally ripped. I, 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 I wish I looked like that at 36. <laughs> no, no, I won't look like that at 68. If you start now, Mike, you're in for a good shot. Um, so speaking of... requires effort. <laughs> speaking of both Netflix and things uh, putting money in certain places, I the other night was like, I will always watch a, a horror movie. It doesn't matter what quality it is. I love horror. Mm. And so I put on this movie that it recommended to me that's called Choose or Die, or otherwise is called Cursor. Um, and the concept is not a unique one, but it's a video game that kills people. They play it, the choices that they make in the game could impact real life. Um, and they can't call it choose your own adventure because that's copyrighted and they're very litigious. It also um, choose or die and cursor fit into the film pretty well. There's another one called stay alive, where if you die in the game, you die in real life. That, uh, anyway, there are a bunch of them, but, um, did not think the film was particularly good. Uh, but... It, they had some really interesting choices, and one of them was clearly a British cast who frequently messed up their American accents, and mm-hmm. clearly shot in England, but they tried to make it seem like New York. Yes. Not See also sure the why. bubble. Yeah. I kept trying yeah. to look for the power outlets because I'd be like, they can't change That's those. The tell. But the streets, it was so clearly English. Why did they not just what, 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 choose, 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 choose choose or die? Or um, but there are other things that were really interesting to do with like when you can see the filmmaking happening that I wonder if a lot of audiences will picture like there are very few sets in this movie there's one part where they take a road trip but the only footage that you see of the road trip is this one shipping dock and the rest of it they put in video game and it was like well clearly they only had the ability to rent the shipping dock so they didn't do the rest of the road trip because they couldn't afford it mm. and then there's another part where conflict that happens in what looks like a a room that's just full of like um, dry ice like it's just like a uh, fake gas whatever right, and yeah, the fog fog yes that's what i'm looking for and it's clearly it's just eddie there Marson in yes. everything eddie Marson was a surprising addition to the film um why is he always in everything he's very good like, like you can't good. he's in absolutely everything isn't he um, i think that usually implies a very affordable day rate yeah i would think that <laughs> like eric roberts is in ten thousand movies yeah because he only had to shoot Same with bruce willis like bruce willis had eight movies come out last year i think because most of them were yeah a week shooting at most for him isn't for him yeah a lot of body shooting? doubles he's done now yeah he's yeah, out. yeah it's very sad yeah um but yeah it was, he very, was clearly it was just, just creating a nest egg you know totally it was just very Take interesting to can. see this movie where, where like there was a part where in theory you would see a monster in theory and i was like they can't afford to show the monster there's no way and so it doesn't happen <laughs> they just don't oh, really just yeah never... there was loads of stuff where it was like no they do- i know that this movie doesn't have the budget because of the amount of shit that they've cut away from there's no way that they can create a cgi monster <laughs> they didn't it was just a hole in a door it's like <laughs> there you go um Aww. fun watch but it's just a very interesting thing to, to be able to so obviously see a budget and and be able to guess what's happening in the film because of the budget and they did their best and were creative and like I'm sure it was a very low budget. Like I said, the scene that's just fog in a room was like, that's a great way to have a very dramatic scene that is kind of spooky, but really all you did was make some hallways and put some fog in a room. Like, all right, <laughs> like go for it. But I, I wonder if most people will see that or if that be, like has become a part of my brain as I've worked on a thing that costs money more. I don't know uh, if more, more people will notice that. It doesn't have a great score across the board. It's so interesting how... Uh sort of video game concepts uh, always come across. Like anytime you try to make something sort of game-like in a movie, it's almost always just agonizingly cheesy. Um, and somehow the only exception to that cheesy. is the amazing Doug Lyman, uh, Tom Cruise, uh, Emily Blunt movie. Um, oh yeah, Live, the- I Repeat, as they call it now. Mm. Uh, what was it called originally? It's- Edge of Tomorrow. Edge of Tomorrow. Uh, or um, that, that movie's great. Um, the movie's amazing. Code. 
Source Code's great as well. Source similar, code. similar. I saw Northman. And similar kind of game logic. Roguelike movie. Yeah, I uh, saw yeah. Northman last night, and that is made is by. Is that good? I've heard great things by that. I really enjoyed it. I don't know that everybody will. I think it's probably going to be okay. pretty split. I did really enjoy it though, but there are so many things in it that are so video gamey, <laughs> like a little. There's just like it. Oh, I, was, I wanted to talk to him so bad to be like, "Do you play video games? This this is fucking questy as hell. Like, get the sword at this hour from this, and then fight it, and like." All right. Okay. I see your inspiration, but not obviously a video game thing. I would agree that lived out. See, now that's a, that raises one. an interesting question because yeah. my 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 knee jerk reaction is to go that narrative structure in games mm. is a is rarely a writing boon for that game. It's seemingly always a way to create content to lengthen a game. Uh, it often feels that way to me. Like like games that are more concise tend to work better for, for me where I'm at in my life. And so anything that feels side questy, like I remember feeling that way watching Mandalorian where I thought he's spending so much time running errands and not doing the thing that he's supposedly doing because it's like, well, I'll give you the sword, but first I need the dungeon key. Well, I'll give you the dungeon key, but first I need the, you know, the helm of, and it's like, Oh, for the love of God, that, that, that that's not actually a compelling narrative structure. And it's, so it's think, one of those, do you, do, sorry, go on. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, apologies. I was going to say like, do we think that's coming from games or is that just coming from legend? Like that's Beowulf, like go to a place and find a thing that lets you get to the next thing that find a place. It's true. Like that doesn't feel yeah, the specifically Odyssey. gaming. Uh, yeah. If we want to go back sure. super far. Also, uh, in my experience, and obviously I can't speak for everybody, the concept of this is in the game to make the game longer doesn't really exist. Um, no. From the writers or from the narrative design team, it's always like everything that I keep being told. Cause when I first started at SMS, I kept like being like, how long would this bit be? And they'd be like, don't worry about it. And I just couldn't get it out of my head that I was like, but I need to know for this, how long is it as a scene? They were like, yeah. don't worry about it. I keep being told. So how, sorry, how long is the new God of War? Just so for the, for the, don't, thumbnail. don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> everything uh, will end up being three times longer than you plan for. Um, that is yeah. what I keep being told. Video games will always end up being three times longer than you plan for <laughs> and that you should expect them to be too long and to require cuts. And I, I would not have thought that before working on a design team. Um, and I wonder if that's industry wide that I don't know if the consensus of we need to do this to make this longer actually exists in video I've games. I've seen it. I've the, seen it um, on multiple games oh. I've worked on. Uh, People uh, really? have said I, that to you? Well, obviously I'm in no... Uh, not to me as if as if I somehow could make it longer, but I have I have asked questions before about hmm. X Y Z content, and they're like, we are basically under pressure from the publisher. Are they indie? To to uh, it it well, it depends on how you define indie. Hmm. Someone who is beholden to a publisher one way or the other is the reason why this comes up. So in the hmm. strictest hmm. sense of indie. Uh, this this wouldn't come up, but I've seen it on games where, and I mean, I remember this was a this was a concern during Journey when Journey was clocking in at like eighty minutes, and they were going, they were you know the, remembering that this was twenty twelve and it was a very different market than today. They were going, what game could we possibly compare this with? Players are going to think that this is a ripoff no matter what we charge. It was a huge issue just, with the order, obviously. Like people were very upset about the length of that game. So it which is I a think problem. Is woefully unfair. Me too. I like that game a lot. That, Plus, go play it today. Fact, it I looks wish like been it, a sequel. I know. It looks like it just came out. It's that beautiful. game has held up visually unbelievably. I liked it a lot. It, needed, so, it deserved a sequel. I wonder sure. if it's again the studio. I would I work agree for with you. It's rare. Has a very specific agree. structure in that, like, it is a very story first studio, and that is not necessarily that common in AAA. I was just talking at, at GDC to somebody who works uh, for well, maybe I shouldn't say another AAA studio, and. They were asking me about that because they'd heard that about Santa Monica Studio and they were like, man, that must be so nice as a writer. Because <laughs> a lot of other studios, things function in a way that's like you get a level and then they're like, and then, and then you write it. <laughs> it's like a very different direction, which I do worry you've been spoiled, thing. Alana. Oh, I for I sure do have. I worry you've, but there, you've, you've 100% worked yourself There are very like, few AAA studios, studios that I would work places. for. That's why, though. Like I say, like uh, okay. it would only be SMS or Rockstar. And that's why. <laughs> 
which like I'm aware is like maybe an indie studio would be fine, but otherwise it's those two in AAA. No, I'd say I'd say we have we have equal, if not potentially more pressure than what Austin's describing. Because yeah, in most cases you're beholden. We're I lucky if it's in I think just not a thing that is in my department at all that writers are but they probably are i don't know because again i'm and this isn't just the studio i work for it is conversations i've had with other people that have been like no no no, the game was way longer than we hoped i always hear that so i'm wondering <laughs> if it's only when something's on the extremely short side that the publisher goes it needs to be longer it's risk my no it's 100 percent that's risk i think it also no one's saying this game needs to be this game that 20 hours needs to be 30 hours it's entirely about it's way avoiding lower. the danger so with your game um, and your studio, there's an understanding and an acknowledgement, and just in, there's just an awareness of what a game from your studio is. They'd going have to an end assumption of length, like. and also it's like six hundred yeah, people. Like you're not gonna. Yeah. You have to. All those people have to have work to do. <laughs> like you can't just make if something. If Corey tiny. walks into a room, if yeah, if Corey if Corey goes over to Herman's, like the next game's going to be three hours long, mm. then yeah, the matter of time is going to come up as an issue, but it's understood. Yeah, that's true. And I think on the indie side, it's similar to an extent, again, like people like known quantities. So we as a studio don't ever get asked about game length by partners because our games are well, we, 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 they've, we've never had a review that said this game was too short. So therefore no one worries about us in or that too sense. Long, or too long, probably. too long. What are you, or, like, well, yeah, we're, five-ish? We're quite concise. Five-ish? In terms of hours? Yeah. Wick was probably the longest. That's probably about six or seven. That makes um, sense. But yeah, no, exactly. Um, it's and, and that's and that's been generally fine. What I would say I worry about more as a writer is um, relative timing. So while I won't add stuff to a game just to inflate the full running time, there is one hundred percent like a pacing choice. I'm sure you've For made sure. similar choices yeah, yeah, yeah. where like you're like this is I, this bit is too I'm long adding, because it doesn't feel right. This bit is too, too short long or not long enough. Yeah, exactly. Needs, yeah. The player needs a bit of space to think about the thing Absolutely. that just happened. Yeah. We have to have some content here for them to churn through while that's whirring in the back of their head. That, but that's craft. That's that's pacing. That's that, that's something that's essential. Mm. But as you say, it's also you can do your best to achieve it, but also you never know which bits a player is going to get stuck on, how long something's going to end up taking. We tend to work towards uh, like a minimum time. So from a from a you know, we need to, from a risk mitigation point of view, we're like, this game has to be at least this long, so we'll make sure that you, you know, a, a relative speed run without using any exploits will take X amount of time, and our average player, we want it to take about this long, and we'll kind of bear that in mind as we go, but beyond that, no, and we're, we're not we're not fussed. The, um, but I, so I, I in genre how games common or it is then. franchises. How, like, Austin, was this a prevalent thing that you had heard? Studios say that it needed to be. You've longer. probably worked on many more games than us combined. <laughs> That's true. Actually. That is one of the. That is one of the uh, perks of of this. Credits line of all work. over it's, the place. Sure. You're a it, hub. It is. It is. I do get to. I get a good sampling of different, different types of teams, different yeah. types of genres of games. You know, different publisher developer relationships, all that kind of stuff. I feel very lucky to have a really eclectic uh, sort of experience set to draw from so far. I wouldn't say it's been that way on even a majority of games, but it's definitely been a but it does exist. noticeable thing. And I think I think the crucial aspect that you kind of tapped on the edges of, Mike, when you said a studio like SMS is sort of a known quantity. I think that the genre of the game is also a giant part of of what expected might, length. Yeah, like because uh, I I I there was one that I worked on where as they were you know moving towards you know the they could see the light at the end of the tunnel uh, and the game was was not finished. There was still plenty of room for things to change and evolve and whatnot. As they kind of took stock on what the trajectory was looking like, they realized they were going to come in with less overall content than comparable titles in that space. Mm. And that was a big concern for the publisher because it was like players will come to this with a certain amount of expectation. You, Yeah, I, I should be able to do this or or that at minimum. Yeah. And if if I'm below that minimum or at least even if I'm not, but there's just the perception that I'm below that minimum, 
uh, that that can that can kill us. Um, and I remember that, that being an interesting of all times. 100%. Yeah, it, interesting. It was, but it was very contextual to the kind of game, you know, because like mm. we're still talking about a game that's far longer than you know Journey, and especially once Journey kind of once people played it and realized, oh yeah, this shouldn't be longer. Like this, this shouldn't, this this, you know. This really is the Gandalf, like it took his leg exactly as long as it needed kind of model. Um, and they were merciless, that game company, about cutting everything that added fluff. Like the game was meant to be 100% sort of trimmed of all fat and, and superfluous content um, such that you couldn't cut anything else, but everything was essential. Um, and that was sort of, I think, what, what drove that. And the fact that... That was unusual at the time. Definitely required placating some some Sony nerves, I believe, uh, at the time. It helped that Journey was overall not that expensive to make, but it was. Well, that's the weirdest part of this is that strangely, I'd say Journey and you know, Sony's internal games in general um, are simultaneous, and this is true of any platform holder, like simultaneously probably the higher ups are having to have lots of conversations about this stuff, but at the same time are supported in the marketplace so strongly that I think you can overcome. So, if, so, you know, if a game, if, if uh, let's, let's move away from, let's say the next gears of war. There you go. If the next gears of war game, I'm just going to help you out a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you. Save a lot. Your soul doing this. Yeah. Let's say the next gears of war game is like half the duration of any previous gears of war game. There are a lot of people in Microsoft and in their marketing departments who can frame that and position that for the audience and can kind of explain that to the audience and make that something that's kind of known and comfortable with in a way that if a a double A studio or even like an uh you know a triple A studio like Ubisoft or EA probably doesn't have the same level of resource to do that or and won't. So they're more likely to pressure the developers, just add some filler, you know, potentially. With something like Journey, you know, yeah, you 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 got to cut all that fat, but like Journey wasn't competing in the marketplace, um, like another indie game studio. Like they were, they had this 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 uh, red carpet rolled out for them, and that allowed them probably a a bit more creative freedom and control, and a bit less fear of the audience backlash than uh, an indie developer who didn't have that level of support. Wonder, it's, not, it's good you should take advantage when you have that situation. I'm not knocking them for it, but like, there's definitely like a different amount of politics involved there, right? Yeah, related to that, I wonder if it's prevalent in AAA. Again, me saying, I don't think this exists, comes from me realizing it didn't, in my experience, but then also talking to other people, other writers in AAA, and them all saying the same thing. So I wonder if it's- well, Also, they're not in the room, potentially. That's true. They're not it's in the rooms where those conversations right? are happening. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Like, <laughs> it's saying, just Corey, that I expected the, it to be part of my job. Of, it's the, not. the director of Gears of War. Yeah. Thank the you. director of Gears of War. There you go. Who is that? He's not, no, he's, he's not Rod Ferguson. He's um, on Diablo. I don't even know who the director of Gears is right now. That doesn't I, exist. I think it's Cliffy I think. B. No. <laughs> Cliff's back. Um, <laughs> Cliff's back. <laughs> Gears of War 7. <laughs> um, no, I think, um, yeah, they're having that conversation. Like, you yeah, know, you're probably right. Frankly, like part of your job leading a games company is 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 having to deal with difficult conversations that that, that the team doesn't necessarily need to hear at, at indie scale and at small scale. I'm much more transparent with my team because that makes sense. But like at a big company, I imagine there's a lot of drama that you're probably very glad that your bosses are not telling you about. That you yeah, really it's the job to protect know? the the creatives. I think in a lot of cases. Yeah. So that's entirely you, uh, true. Yeah. yeah, it makes me. Uh, it makes me think of something I never actually thought about before. Um, the Mass Effect franchise being um, not, especially the first game, I never thought of those as like really mainstream kind of games because they're fairly in the weeds RPGs. Sure. Which is mm. not a, that's not the same thing fundamentally as a Halo or a Zelda or something, which is, I think, just casts a far wider net, right? Sure. And so Mass sure. Effect always had this interesting challenge of as the budget by the time they got to Mass Effect 3 was clearly like they, they had become such a critical darling and had such a loyal following that they they clearly took a bit of a um, gamble on the third one to be a pretty high budget, high prestige title. 
But there's only so far you can really go with that because there's just only so many sales a game like that is likely to yield. And it makes me wonder, I never thought about before, one of the kind of controversial decisions at the time was the inclusion of multiplayer in Mass Effect 3, which directly impacted your story potential. So basically, it? if you didn't... Yeah, they've, they've mitigated this subsequently with, the, with patches and then, of course, in the Legendary Edition. But originally, at launch... Um, you couldn't um, achieve the most uh, sort of like the the most ideal outcome without logging time playing multiplayer. Wow, that's a terrible idea. Mm. Uh, it, it was a way to... I did like that multiplayer, but that's a terrible idea. I actually really liked it from the standpoint... I wish they could have they could have done like a skirmish mode that had the same effect. But what I liked about it from a purely immersive storytelling standpoint was that w the storyline is telling us there is a giant war, like a, a war on a level that you can't even comprehend across like thousands of planets involving everyone in the galaxy happening right now. And you being the hero and the leader of the military, you're kind of only existing at the high level decision making. You're, you know, la you don't really taste the boots on the ground reality of the war, but the multiplayer gave you this feeling of, uh, you know, they're, they're like, oh, we need to evacuate this city. Just go help some civilians out because there's an invasion and we're just trying to pull them out. And it made it, it made it feel like, approach. yeah, it made it feel like you need to dip your toes periodically in, in the reality of, of this larger conflict. That's not, if I win this battle, all I get out of it is I save a few people's lives. I don't like win the war and defeat the boss. And it's way more narrow in, in scope. And I felt like as a, as a counterpoint, especially just a, whenever you feel like doing it, not, not driven by narrative, but just, Oh, I want to play some multiplayer. It somehow added to the overall feeling. Now, part of it is that I have very rose colored glasses and I just love everything about mass effect. And in particular mass effect. You so no, I could, I could, I, as my, as my shepherd helmet is just, it the edge is of frame. Bioware's um, highest selling game you. ever. Mass effect yeah. really Three sold seven million. more than dragon age. Dragon age inquisition was 6 million. Wow. Had guns in it. Had guns in it. Seven million. Yeah. Um, uh, that's interesting. Well, I, I, all, all of which is to say, it makes me wonder if part of the calculation on the budget was a multiplayer mode will be an investment in the game's ecosystem that's separate from just <laughs> the core. We've been spooling up this big grand epic story and we're bringing it home and people want to see how it ends. But there's actually, there's even just a foundational gameplay reason for people to join. I never thought of it as like, you know, a kind of potentially quasi hedge betting uh, move to, to, and I don't, I've never heard that, you know, spoken to. I have no idea if that was a thing because hmm. it was definitely a bit controversial and they made it, Way more optional. I think Mass Effect 3 was also the first days. one that required you to download Origin to play it on PC, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And that yep, was that also was, that controversial. Was, <laughs> that, one, that was my, that was my, just like the orange box, that was my, uh, I remember the orange box was what forced me to download Steam. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this was, uh, this was the, the thing first that forced origin. me to download. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my first Origin was I like mean, a press key for yeah. something, I think. Go, sorry, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> No, you're absolutely right. I'm just saying Austin's absolutely right. I think the um, the other thing is, of course, uh, the the emphasis and the investment in third person action in the second Mass Effect game. Like, there's definitely it was of that era where that was because the reality is, if you've not if you've got any kind of media property that's not just saturated to the extent that everyone's experienced it already, which Mass Effect obviously never hit that level. The, the first sale, the sale. Mass Effect. Mass Effect. Th these stats are really interesting, and I think what like this whole conversation yeah. is interesting in general is like, is Mass Effect mainstream? To us, it feels like it is, but probably not really. The average gamer has no, not, not played the first Mass Effect, so I mean, in that era, games weren't mainstream. That's true. <laughs> like, um, the first Mass Effect, two million. Yeah, that is Bioware. So probably one of their worst yeah. selling games. If your sales pitch for the third game huh. was exclusively finish the story you started, then by definition, there's a cap on that audience to what, however many number two sold. Like, because that's if that's the only reason, in the same way as if Better Call Saul was marketed as, you know, find out about what happened to, you know, the triggered Breaking Bad, finally the story you've been looking for. If that was the only pitch, then they're capped to Breaking Bad. That approach works if you're 
promoting Avengers Infinity War because <laughs> everyone has experienced that stuff. So you know, hey, our audience for Infinity War is a subset of everyone in the world. Cool. Whereas I actually think know, that one went the other way. I think, like, I think you're right, but I think they luck. I think they just they inherited. Well, they they built something that that uh, managed to go. It, it, it like reversed the polarity, you know, where there were people mm. seeing Infinity War who had been completely checked out of the MCU because sure. the hype reached such a fever pitch that they're like, okay, fine, I'll go see this one. I may as well see how it all. You have like, to. I, I haven't I've bothered with the works. twenty prior. <laughs> I've heard it's actually. I, there's a, a YouTuber I like called um, Patrick Willems who did a video where his he, his parents saw it, and the I think the only Marvel movie they'd seen was Iron Man, and he took them to see. I think it was Endgame, specifically the second one. And he, they, they want. Cultural they just phenomenon. told him one day. I'm similar to what Austin said. Of like, they just they felt like they had to watch it, so they asked him if he could take them. And he recorded like basically a 40 minute interview with them after, and they got it. Like, it's a testament to how good the storytelling and the writing is in those movies. I will that, shit like, on those movies for plenty. They of explain things. the whole story. I think the fact that Endgame came together, it was viewable by everyone and legible, but then mm. also threaded 20 movies over a decade with like the exact traces of where the Tesseract was and when for all the people who got mm -hmm. hardcore and made sense is yeah. incredible. <laughs> it's good character payoff I, too. It's for, for just I, amazing. Like genuinely, Alana, I I unironically recommend the audio commentaries for Infinity War and Endgame. Mm. Like basically, the six hours that that's uh, it's up to. It's the it's the directors and I think one of the writers. And they basically don't talk about anything except what you're talking about, the story it's stuff. It's so and the impressive. It's and but listening to them talk about like like I genuinely like I've recommended that to like young writers of like go and spend six hours. Oh, but it's it's just a Marvel movie. It's like no, go and spend six hours and listen to the thought process behind every. I love the dismissive idea, like. That. This thing that a billion people got excited about. Oh, it's just one of those. Yeah, but You've I mean, met they young have young creatives, they, right, Austin? They, okay, as a young creative, they have a formula that I don't <laughs> like and got very bored mm. of. Um, and and the humor and the structure and the arcs. Like, there are a lot of things that are very samey about them in a way that, like, I don't disagree with the popcorn criticism, even though I went and saw them all. But like, if you were to dismiss all of that, like, well, it's Disney. They have all this money. Of course, they can make this happen. No, that almost makes it harder. The fact that it's owned by Disney and they have all the money in the world and they didn't have executives look being at, like, no, 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 no. And Look at Star Wars on a parallel look, track. Totally look at Star Wars on a parallel track. I don't even know what happened in that last fucking movie. I still don't know what happened. We have to stop talking about Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just very impressive that it all managed to come together. I, I don't know if anyone will ever be able to do it again. <laughs> like, it's amazing. Wu -Tang no, it, it does first. feel like it does feel like they are they are flapping in the wind right now and a bit like the Spider-Man film was 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 really fun and a, and a great a great that was amazingly uh, written though as well beautiful, with the beautiful. Actually, yeah I I I, I, I have beef with I, it but you know really on a, on what uh, I think I, we might have spoken about this before that I didn't buy no we have to help the mass murderers as a motive it was like this is illogical and ridiculous you're oh, you're oh, risking oh. the fabrics of reality this doesn't make any fucking sense <laughs> nobody would do this I did find that, I did it. find um, I did find uh, Doctor Strange oddly easily persuadable to do a world altering yeah, spell. Yeah, something that would destroy absolutely everything. No, none of you would have done any of this. No, He's, but I let it go. A, and then I had a great time. He was always a good voice of reason. So it was yeah. a little. It was a little bit like no, no. We we need this movie <laughs> and his movie to happen. So just roll with it. Uh, yeah. And it was like, well, okay, I, I but can. But then I can, again, I had a moment where I was like, I just need to let that go. It's fine. It's a comic book movie. And then I let it go and it was great. It was very emotional. I had a good time. I love the Screen I... Rant uh, pitch meeting uh, observation about that movie where they talk about, like, we need to send them home. Uh, we need to send these villains home back to, like, you know, kind of face their destiny in their, in their original timeline. Except the movie earlier establishes that they all were, like, warped out at the Just exact moment they of their death. So you're like, we got to send them back. We got to send them to, to, to the exact moment of their death. That's yeah. like our big, that's our big achievement. Uh, which I was like, yeah, you're right. They don't actually address that. I some don't logic think they... problems, some logic problems. But it, again, it's fine. Um, well, it's actually I... not a logic problem. It's like, because it, it, uh, there's nothing, I don't think there's anything logic breaking about that. It's just sort of like, it's like they forgot. If they forgot 
the premise of their own it's crusade. unfinished business isn't it it's 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 a ghost story it's the idea of them making amends before their last moment that's how i read it that's a very uh, charitable finding peace in their last moment hmm. that's that was my read anyway I did not take it but no definitely like anyone watching this who wants to write like genre stuff definitely go Sp- and watch speaking those wait wait pause can i what pause? the fuck yeah. is up with the hoodie thing uh, where, where? <laughs> you don't remember you were there so we got a bunch of comments on a recent episode about how nice I was like, was Austin's I not hoodie in the room? was no you were at one point during the episode we were saying a bunch of shit about religion that we knew everyone would be mad about and so Mike said give us a compliment tell Austin how nice his hoodie is or something along those lines so wow, then there was a little past me no you responded to I it I think you were saying something particularly sacrilegious we just don't remember what we say yeah. Um, yeah. that's true another I, interesting I... Bioware sales fact for you <laughs> okay good Baldur's Gate the projections for the commercial performance of Baldur's Gate were very low, which makes sense. Bioware expected to have worldwide sales of 200,000, which would be enough for them to justify a sequel. Um, what, what year? 2000, what year 2003, Gate? I think. Baldur's Gate wasn't earlier? No, that, that would have to be earlier than that. That's the latest sales. Mm-hmm. What year did Baldur's Gate come out? It has to be earlier. That's much earlier than that, I think. Baldur's yeah, because I, I love those humble, like, 90s. Like, if we sold 100,000 copies, it was the best... You know, it was our best year ever. We have 2003 was when we had worldwide sales of 2.2 million, and they had they had hoped to just get a measly 200,000. Isn't that incredible? They had an order of magnitude more than they were expecting. Wild. Anthem still sold 5 million. Mass Effect Andromeda, 5 million. Mass Effect 2, 5 million. Dragon Age Inquisition, 6. Anthem do 5 million. 5 million. That's actually genuinely impressive, yeah. given... A game um, that's considered, like, essentially a failure or at least game. disappointing. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, that kind of thing is always is always those those different perspectives uh, of and and the kind of by way of analogy the sort of like Overton window of sales moving mm. of what constitutes a a hit versus a failure um, is so endlessly uh, interesting to the me. Industry and, and, do and, be changing, and 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 to that yes. end, you know the fact that such small teams can also make such great games like the, the with the way like we talk obviously about inscription a lot or Unpacking. obviously yeah yeah another great example your eyes. um oh, where, they're lovely by the way i met them for the first time they are lovely aren't they yes the unpacking they oh folks. yeah the oh. unpacking folks are lovely and so are the before your eyes folks um and inscription mm. folks also good <laughs> they're all i've heard lovely. that i've not met them but i've heard they're great yes all wonderful the jerks <laughs> oh dare you make something that fucking brilliant and when you think about it, a team my generation just... of indie devs all turned out to be monsters. They, they were the better. <laughs> just give them time. This group is still fermenting. Um, right. I got. I'm still upset about this. Somebody in the comments was like, "Just really want to give Austin a shout out for recommending that I play Inscription." Yeah, that you that's play. How it that's how it worked. Out. <laughs> I mean, look. Let's just face facts. That he was, played that, it that because of me. No, no, no. That 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 commenter is the only one that has a real window into reality. Oh, infuriating. <laughs> I love it when the commenters give me a quote from you and say, I really liked Mike's point about that. That was great. It's, I, it's, I it's also in no way telling of larger Rahul problems always, in culture Rahul at paints large. Warhammer and often gets like, oh, cool, you're into Warhammer. Because of me. <laughs> Nobody ever gets, like, you should try you to get Alana that. into it. Did Who do you think get, got him into did it? He, <laughs> did he get Alamo Del Toro into it? That's my question. It's a good question. Because I've seen them interact on Twitter and Alamo Del Toro is now doing the models. I have no idea. And that's... To have any influence on him <laughs> is a lot. Is, I, I will take credit for that, that also if I, if I could, as the person who got Rahul I think so, yeah. As a, I will take it. You're, you're two layers above in the pyramid. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. I look really forward to a credit. month from now when I'm credited with <laughs> getting, getting Rahul into Warhammer. 100%. If everyone in the comments could just congratulate Austin on getting Rahul into yes. Warhammer. Yes. This time so I'm going to remember. I'm going to do my best week. to remember this moment. Um, I'm actually going to intro the show right now. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Play Watch Listen. This is episode 99. <laughs> look at us go. I am a lot of peace. I'm a video game writer. That is Mike Bithel. He's a video game director. That is Austin Wintry. He's a video game composer. Troy, still busy. I think Troy. Yeah, he actually. I actually texted him to say, "Are you going to be able to join us?" And he was like, "I'm. I'm hoping we wrap in time." And sent me a little fingers crossed emoji. And okay, I'm guessing that means to. they didn't. Um. So we're still <laughs> trying to figure out what we want to do for episode 100. So I'm going to recommend that people follow at pwl underscore podcast on Twitter, and that is where I will post the updates. Um. We're planning to try to do a live stream episode. Uh. But have to figure out the timing for that because schedules are a nightmare. 
second thing I wanted to mm. say, um, Austin obviously just got back from a trip where he's grown a beard. Um, really, it's how you can tell he's been living his best life. But I really wanted to ask you about Monkey Island. It's been that long since we ah uh, yeah I, I I uh it made me excited to see that they're that they're doing it I think it's um it raises an eyebrow for Tim to not be involved yeah um I and I know obviously he's mostly just busy with his own company uh so I don't you know put too much thought into that but I just think of him as so central It'd be to cool what if those he could like were. consult or something but yeah he's got a, a whole ass double find to run. Yeah, and I, but I did, I, I did. It always warms my heart when I see uh, the like the press release. Essentially, it's like sentence three, where they said, including the return of Clint Bajaki and Peter McConnell and Michael Land, uh, the original three composers who were the, they were the trio who did. They were the basically the audio department of Lucas Arts in the late '80s through the '90s, where each person. You know, Michael Land famously did the music on Monkey Island and mm -hmm. they would all kind of help on sound design and audio implementation and programming. Uh, Peter, of course, did the music for Grim Fandango. Uh, Clint did the music for Outlaws. Uh, and they all, you know, like I, I, th I seem to remember once, I think it was Clint told me he recorded a Harley in the lobby at ILM for sound designing on Full Throttle. Like literally like making the glass like flex as it just roars this unbelievably loud engine just in the lobby. Uh, something like that. I think it was Clint who told me that. Um, so, yeah, anyway, those three guys are like three of my heroes. I've never actually I met Michael once, but Clint and Peter are both good friends. And it's one of those things of I consider it a, an incredible privilege of my career trajectory that I can call someone who were genuinely childhood heroes of mine um, as just friends uh, that i that i that i you know could call at any moment and it wouldn't Grant be a weird thing <laughs> jesus uh and uh but uh uh i refuse to dignify uh <laughs> never heard of him um but no yeah i so anyway i i liked that it made me happy that they they made a point of saying it's that so and cool. i thought their little and, and teaser was evocative the you know, only way that it's like it, it's so it feels like it's rare that you see something like that actually get remade from the, the same people, largely, obviously, except for Tim. Um, and that they got to do it on... The creator had made a joke about if he were ever to make another Monkey Island, he'd tweet it on April 1st. And that's exactly how they announced it. Like, yeah. the fact that that all came together. I don't know. It's just, like, so... There was one awesome. thing that struck me as curious was that Ron Gilbert said it would... I don't think it's a remake. It's essentially a sequel yeah. to Monkey Island 2. Two. Which I thought was interesting because it made it sound like we pretend none of the others happened. Now, I understand the, the yeah. kind of awkwardness regarding the Telltale games, but Monkey Island 3 was awesome. You can't deny, like, to me, Curse of Monkey Island was kind of like, you know. No longer canon. That's that's Monkey Island Legends now. That's uh, Monkey, Curse of Monkey Island, the yeah, third one? Yeah, there you go. He's joking. Yeah. No, it's no, it's it's it's. I they, get that. They, I, I get wiped that. the slate clean except one and two. I think. I think they're carrying. But that doesn't make. I never, Wait, never that made official? sense to me because Lucas Arts like it was. It was the three games. I, I'm, now I'm worried. I've heard a rumor, and I'm going to just quickly double check. I this. could. I could be I totally wrong. I, 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 I understand. Think, I, think I understand the Telltale games then... were like sort of non-canonical, just sort of they're their own thing. But I thought the third one. I thought. The core actual LucasArts yep. titles were a few trilogy. Return to Monkey Island uh, will be a direct continuation of Monkey Island Two, a direct sequel to Monkey Island Two. There you yeah, go. Yeah, no, I, I de no, no, I definitely. You're you're right. I I heard that. That's that's what I'm. But I'm just. I find that I find that peculiar because the third one was excellent. Um, and uh, at least I remember it being excellent, and it felt very much like a sequel to the second, which was a great sequel to the first. Like to me, those three are an excellent trilogy of games. And I, I, and that's why I forgive them going, yeah, the, the legends or whatever that followed the kind of episodic telltale thing was like, eh, that never happened, but it was odd to, to me. I, I mean, there's clearly something I don't know that would provoke sweeping the third one under the rug. I always love, if nothing else, the insult sword fighting, wherein you have to rhyme with your opponent, 
which was the wrinkle they added since the third one was the first one that was voiced. And uh, the whole premise is we're not just sword fighting, but now we're swashbuckling on the decks of pirate ships. And they go, the rule on the open sea is that the the insults have to rhyme. Uh, and I was, as a kid, it, it, it was so uh, delightful to me to be the way they tutorialize that is they they get you in a sea shanty that it's an endless loop that you can't get out of and everything you say they'll rhyme with <laughs> and until eventually one of the dialogue options that starts to filter into the choices is to end with the word orange uh, <laughs> which is what grinds the whole thing to a halt and gets you actually out of the eternal loop and i always remember like that just it's just one of those very memorable little it's moments such a good of sense sort of, of gameplay writing yeah. Yeah, yeah it's so good is, is it's there so... an easy way for anyone who hasn't because again monkey island probably not that popular in the grand scheme of things um are they playable like you play them just there's on a great, pc yeah there's a the, I think yeah Steam. there was an awesome special edition version recently out, oh um, dude the the, the 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 remastered monkey island you can flick between the two yes. versions right? oh, cool. not, like just, not just that they, like Halo, the original yeah. score was all you know midi it predated monkey island collection on steam it, it predated cd-rom you know like the original the original uh, was all, of course, electronic, and when they did the the remastered uh, edition, uh, my friend Jesse Harlan, who was who was the uh, kind of in house music director at LucasArts at the time, working with some other some other folks, had to reconstruct the original score down to the note so that when you hit F eleven or whatever would talk would flip back and forth, the music would crossfade right on the beat Whoa. to the old version of the music as well. Damn. Uh, like throughout the game. So the, the, the fact that, that the Halo fact does that not do put that. that oh, it, it, and cause it's all the new ones, all live instruments and sounds amazing. They produced it so beautifully. I just uh, play that through again. I would like to oh, as well. So and they're not that long. It's funny. The monkey Island collection on steam is currently 25, 46 and I might buy it, but it says more like this and recommended as fable anniversary. That makes sense to me that those would be in the same category. Spyro Reignited Trilogy also makes sense. And then Papers, Please. <laughs> Papers, Please is, is, so it comes up on everything. No, notoriously Papers, just so very um, uplifting, like yeah, cartoony, exactly. funny No, game. it's a maths thing. It's because so, very so witty. the way those... The way those recommendations work is it's things that have been clicked on most by users when visiting games. You think everybody just clicks because, on Papers, Please? It's because Papers, Please has been on there so long. So Thomas was alone often shows up in those for like the weirdest games as well. It was released in those, 2013. Those of us who were there. That was like an early Steam? Uh, early in terms of if you look at the ramp up of content on Steam, yeah, we were hmm. ahead of that curve before before like everything. Back when Steam was releasing, like when Thomas came out, I think Thomas Was Alone was the only game released on Steam for a week. Oh, so wow. Papers, similar to Papers, Please. Like we were so early that everything clicked through, which means there's all this historic data that's driving those no suggestions. Way. So yeah, you'll see Thomas Was Alone pop up under like ridiculously weird like that's super first person interesting. shooters and shit. Um. It's, also worth it's noting. It's also a great way to sell games. It just just oh. go back in time and put them on Steam in 2013, and you'll be fine. It's my uh, that's my key advice to any indie developer right now is start early. <laughs> um, Papers, yeah. please. Has I don't know why it won't pop up now. I was looking at the amount of reviews. So like Spyro has 7,000. For some reason, Papers, please is now just not popping up. But it was at like 40,000. Crash Bandicoot Insane mm -hmm. Trilogy is nine. I guess I guess you're right. It's just been played on Steam so much that it has. Yeah. It's just so brilliant. It What's is weird brilliant. is if you with have older it, games it, than with older games than Papers Please, that oh, number go nosedives because so like older games because Steam didn't always have reviews. So if you go way back, there's games that you'd think would have way more reviews that came out before it that have very few because there didn't used to be reviews on Steam. So, like, hmm. the, the review numbers on a lot of, like, big hit games that you would think would be massive actually have very small numbers. No of. way. People forget that, like, these platforms have been around long enough now that, like, there's legacy and there's, like, the history of different games on there. Like, yeah, if you go back and look at, like, indie games from, like, 2000... Like, what did... Uh, like, Probably think, literally, like, like Half-Life. <laughs> How yeah, many reviews well, does Half-Life have? Life, have? So. Yeah, I mean, considering that so, Half-Life is why Steam exists, essentially. Let's have a look. So Super Meat Boy, for example, 22,000 reviews. That was a very popular Steam which, game. 
But you'd think it would have you more would than think Paperless it would have Please, more than Paperless right? Please, yeah. That's my point, is it kind of nosedives as you go back. It's fascinating. Like Half-Life has probably, a lot of... 58... Super Game Boy probably has more sales than Papers, Please, yeah, I would think, no, overall. Wait, is that... Okay, no, this is That's just... what I'm saying, yeah. So, so... But it should have so it should have more reviews, but it doesn't because it came out before Too reviews, early. So. That's so weird. Um, yeah. came out before the written well, word. it says 58,000 in overwhelmingly positive. Or, no, 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 no. Sorry, it's saying overall reviews, overwhelmingly positive, 58,000. So I think that is saying it has 58,000 reviews. Papers, Please... Doing damn well. Very again, good game if you haven't played it. It's really good. Cheers, Lucas Pope. Yeah. Mm, I love it when we get into yeah. data. Look at us go. Oh, data I used to have to live in Steam Data. I now have other people who worry about Steam Data, you but finally I used to have to spend on. ages thinking about that shit. Yeah. Uh, what can people nice. wish list right now? Somebody left a comment on the all episode of, where you told games. people to wish list. Um, Solitaire conspiracy, and they were like, "I finally did it, Mike. I finally put it on my wish list." It was like, oh, "You really? think you're making like a joke, but it still it. helps." <laughs> yeah, solitaire conspiracy. People should just go and wish list solitaire conspiracy, <laughs> or better yet, like definitely buy it if you want. That'd be sick. Wish list it, then buy it. Do both. Um, Gotta do both for the do algorithm. Both. Do both. Yeah. Leave a good review as well. Like, uh, yeah, <laughs> fifty-eight thousand of them, please. Yeah. Steam is more than most platforms. Steam's Steam is just so like algorithmically driven that there are like the more you interact with games on Steam, the more you click on things and do things around them and leave comments, go on the floor. Like, Same as all YouTube, of that really stuff helps developers. Like, comment, yeah, and subscribe, everybody. Exactly. Thanks for watching. Play, watch, listen. And... Ring that bell. <laughs> uh, I don't even know what the bell does. Gives people notifications. I've never said it before, but there, there you go. Ring, ring the bell. Ring, Ring the bell. The bell. Um, it's so strange. I, I don't understand the point of having that differentiation. <laughs> what, like, why would you subscribe to a channel if you don't want to know when they publish content? I think it's because people subscribe you subscribe, too many channels, and then the ones that you're subscribed to, as someone who very rarely uses YouTube, they they would show up like in more of a feed. Whereas if you ring the bell, it'll come up as like a pop up notification, like you've received a message. I think. I could be wrong. But I get pop-up notifications for YouTube videos for things I don't subscribe to. Really? Based as recommendations. Yeah, but it won't it shouldn't come up in your notification center. It does. Huh. I don't fucking know. I'm sure I can disable that, but half the time Maybe I'm you're like, like oh, slip, that was actually ringing bells in yeah. your sleep yeah, or something. Yeah, he just he can't stop he notifying. Sleep. He can't stop <laughs> ringing bells. Can't help himself. It's so true. <laughs> Um, uh, all right, we will leave it there, everybody. Time. But mm. yes, um, stay tuned to at PWL underscore podcast for whenever we figure out what we're doing for episode 100. I just want to make sure we have Troy. And in theory, that may require us delaying a week. Hopefully not. I don't know, but we'll make it happen. Thank you all for 99 episodes. We will see you next time. Bye. Mm-hmm.